Hello, hola, and namaste. I'm Darshana, and I'm going to be your host in this virtual space, Pelvic Yan, The One Thing. I'm a women's health physiotherapist, and I'm hoping to have conversations with a variety of medical and non-medical providers about anything and everything related to pelvic health, from pee, poo, pregnancy, postpartum, sex, pain, and more. This is a passion project to increase awareness and to get the dialogue started. But this is not medical diagnosis or medical treatment. If you have specific health conditions, please reach out to your providers and do not take your medical advice from the internet. Thank you for spending time with me. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, I would love to hear from you. Let's get started. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm your host, Darshana, and today we're going to be talking to Kristen. Kristen Hill is a licensed mental health therapist. She specializes in perinatal mood disorders, adjustment to parenthood, and birth trauma. After experiencing her own birth trauma in 2013, Kristen became passionate about supporting new mothers by advocating for birth trauma prevention, awareness, and education. In addition to her busy private practice, she volunteers for Perinatal Support of Washington, answering the warm line calls for new mothers looking for support and resources. And she's a busy mom of two young boys, ages six and three. So please help me welcome Kristen. Hi. Hi. Thanks for How having me. How are you? I'm oh, good. Pleasure is all mine. <laughs> so is there anything you want to say to introduce yourself? Is there anything that I missed? Um, I don't think so. I think you got most of it pretty oh. right. Okay. <laughs> So thanks again for taking the time. And I just kind of wanted to know, like, how did you, other than, you know, sharing your birth trauma, how did you got, get into like supporting perinatal period? Yeah. Well, I initially, before I had any kids, was a trained um, couple family therapist. So I already had that um, career and I knew nothing at that point about sort of the specialization of perinatal therapy. And then when I had my first child, and as you mentioned, when I um, experienced a traumatic birth and birth injury, um, that whole world <laughs> broke open for me. Um, and I actually didn't, um, even as a therapist, I didn't really realize um, what I was experiencing, which was postpartum PTSD um, until about a year after um, I had my son. Um, and so I think, you know, what that tells you is that when we're in it, we don't often see it, even as a trained clinician, you know. Um, and so I got connected with a therapist and she uh, specialized in birth um, trauma. And then I can't remember, but somehow I came across the Perinatal Support of Washington, which is a local chapter of an organization, which is Postpartum Support International. Um, which are great resources for women. They should know about both of those um, because they have the international website has like info of every area of the country and of the world, honestly, that has trained professionals um, and it has all the information about groups and um, what to look for. So those are really important um, resources. But I became aware of that organization in somewhere in the process. I think it was a few years out. I had to. Um, have a few surgeries and things like that. So I was kind of in it for a while. And then when I became aware of this organization, I, I wasn't working at the time um, because I had to take a long break because of everything just to take care of myself and my son. And um, I thought, well, I still want to give back because obviously, you know, I didn't know about this resource. And so I'm like, surely most people don't. And so I was able to connect with the local organization and I started doing what is called the warm line that you mentioned. And the warm line is not actually professionals. It's just moms that have also experienced a mood disorder of some kind volunteering their time. And we do, they do get training as to like how to talk to the mothers that are calling in, but it's more just a resource of like, yes, I've been there too. And um, so I was able to get on board there. And it was through that work where I was doing the warm line that I realized, oh, okay, like I, when I go back into work, this is what I want to focus on. And you'll notice that pretty much anyone that I've met that either has become like a doula or a perinatal therapist, um, anyone that's like a birth support person of some kind, it's almost, I, I don't know, it's a high percentage of us that have experienced our own 
either mood disorder, postpartum or trauma that were like, oh, now I want to help other women. And so that's kind of where, then I started just doing a bunch of trainings. Um, and just so I could get really, you know, prepared because it's a different type of therapy that, you know, you can't just be a general, you could be a general therapist and see these women. And some women don't have access to specialized perinatal therapists, but it's ideal if you have someone who has a specialty. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's kind yeah. of where I got to where I am. Thank you for sharing that. Cause it does sound yeah. like a, a niche to kind of understand the special needs and kind of like the unique mm-hmm. challenges that this mm-hmm. period brings. And uh, first of all, I want to kind of commend you for like an accomplished journey. Cause it almost like uh, you're healing while healing others. And, and that's incredible. Sure. So, you know, thank you. Uh, good for you. And I feel like there's something to be said about like, even in the pelvic PT world, we see a lot of pelvic PTs who've had um, some, some journey as a patient, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that kind of then leads them to actually have a better understanding of the other side totally. of the table, you know? Yep. Yep. So when you say birth trauma, mm-hmm. you know, I, if you don't mind elaborating on what mm-hmm. birth trauma means, because uh, some of our listeners might not have heard that term or totally. trauma, usually people just associate it with like physical trauma of something going wrong right. in delivery, which could be part of it. But if you don't mind elaborating what, what is birth trauma? Yeah. So really birth trauma is, can happen even if you don't have those really obvious signs of like traumatic labor or something happening to your infant. Um, it could just be that you didn't feel supported. Um, it could be that um, people were not treating you as someone who could have agency in their birth. So I, I think it's important that women understand that because they might have had a textbook birth, you know, however they'd wanted it, but they may have felt like, um, no one was listening to them, or um, they may have felt like they didn't get to make decisions around what happened. So I think that's a really important distinction to make. Um, but then there are also things that ha- can happen um, that are traumatic, <laughs> like, well, not that are physically traumatic, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, like a, a severe tear, having an episiotomy. Um, some women feel like having to go into emergency C-section is traumatic. Um, obviously anything happening to an infant, um, that is either a loss or a NICU stay. Um, but, um, it is more just when you come out of it feeling like, um, I didn't have agency or you had like a physical, um, difficult experience um, or something happening to your baby, thinking your baby's going to die or you're going to die specifically are also too, too big. Yeah. And predictors. I feel like postpartum in general, like when you talk mm-hmm. about postpartum mental health, there are so many players. There is, you know, obviously the emotions of welcoming yeah. a new member in your family, the physical yeah. challenges, the hormonal challenges. Yeah. So there is sort of no established normal because <laughs> because <Nope. laughs> for a while there. So what are some of the things to kind of be on the lookout for uh, in terms of mm-hmm. like family that is supporting this birthing parent of what are some of the things to look for Mm -hmm. that should tell them that this is where we need to like call in some help like totally what are some of the things yeah so well I think it's important to know that um there's the the um baby blues which can happen up to two weeks and that's it looks similar to depression but it usually tapers off so you you know that is something to watch for if those similar symptoms like crying a lot feeling low uh, having sleep, you know, either sleeping too much or not being able to go to sleep, um, not eating, irritable, um, not connecting with your baby, those kinds of things. If those continue to sort of like veer into the, after the two weeks, then it's important to know that that's probably not baby blues anymore. And it's something else. Um, other things that, so yeah, not connecting with your baby is a big sign of postpartum depression. Um, or just feeling like not connected to the whole experience, honestly, um, food, not wanting to eat, um, sleep. If you're not getting a lot of sleep that can also mirror depression. So it's important to kind of like know that it's, you know, obviously (laughs) sleep is the, like the war that we are all in when we have babies, like trying to figure out how to get enough sleep. And I think that when we're towing that line, you know, between, oh, I might be a little depressed, sleep is going to be that big factor that's going to bump you over, you know, to feeling a little better. So getting at least like four hour chunks when you can is super, super important. Um, 
So I'm, I am I know I listed a bunch of things kind of really fast. So I'm trying to think of other, but I think just if your partner or family member is just not seeming themselves, not seeming interested um, or seeming really with the postpartum anxiety thing, seeming like they're worried about the baby constantly. Um, they, so they don't allow themselves to sleep and they're really hyper vigilant, like kind of waiting for something bad to happen. Um, they're just, again, irritability and anger is a big thing that I think also people don't realize is a part of postpartum depression and anxiety and PTSD. Um, if you're noticing that you have a very short fuse, which obviously we know when we don't get a lot of sleep and you know we're tired, you're gonna have a shorter fuse, but there's a, something a little bit different um, in terms of like the depression, anxiety, irritability, where you're just really quick to get to like level 10 and it feels irrational, but you can't help it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the things to watch for. So it sounds like about like the first couple of weeks you're, you know, I guess normal is a stretch, but yeah. the first couple of weeks, you're just expecting yeah. yourself to be all over the place. And yeah. that's kind of granted given this big mm -hmm. change, right? Totally. Um, and how are we changing that time frame for somebody who had, you know, less than ideal of an experience or maybe they consider traumatic, not traumatic, but something that was not what they signed up for, so to speak. How, how much of a grace period are we giving before we think, okay, now maybe we need to yeah. call in some help. Is, yeah. is that time period changing for them? Um, I think that, I think if there's, if it's obvious and clear that something didn't go well or that um, you felt really upset about your birth, I think anywhere from the first, after the first week or two, I think that, Statistically, we know like the earlier you get help, especially for PTSD, um, the faster you can kind of move past it. I can't remember the, I'm not going to remember the exact like sort of time frame, but in a recent, a couple of recent trainings I took around um, trauma, birth trauma, it, I think it was about like four to six weeks. Once you, if you don't get help before then, that's kind of like where so any symptoms you're experiencing, the severity of them, that's how, that's like how severe they will continue to be um, from that point on. Yeah. It's like they kind of settle in. So if you're noticing that you're having flashbacks, you're avoiding talking about your birth, um, or you're crying when you talk about it, if you're noticing that um, you are hypervigilant, again, that's another, it's a common term in um, PTSD is just you're kind of fearful of something bad happening and you can't sleep, those kinds of things are indicators that you're probably experiencing maybe not full-blown PTSD because not every mom that has a traumatic birth actually has full-blown PTSD, but they have trauma. And those are still powerful experiences that impact us. So they don't have to have full-blown PTSD to get the support you know, that they need. And um, I think that's an, also an important distinction is trauma is trauma. And if you're feeling like this was really hard, it, the sooner you can get connected to someone, the better. Yeah. And I mean, from, in, you know, in the world of pelvic floor dysfunction and yeah. research, what we see is mm -hmm. um, pelvic floor dysfunctions, whenever there is like physical trauma or tearing mm -hmm. or significant mm -hmm. uh, physical, mm -hmm. um, you know, challenges postpartum. Yeah. Uh, those folks are usually twice or sometimes even three times more likely to get postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. Totally. So those are some of the other markers to keep yes. in mind that if you mm -hmm. did actually have an obvious physical trauma, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. chances are you're more, more like, I mean, it just makes sense, right? Your yeah. postpartum is just not fun with those adult diapers and mm -hmm. your bottom hurting all the time. So yes. if you are struggling with some physical healing, it would just make sense to reach out to somebody sooner. I mean, what, what you've got to lose, maybe everything's fine. Right. And that's a better scenario than waiting for too long. Right. I agree. And I think what I would add is just that we, I think as a women in society, I guess, in general, I think that we're kind of pre-trained to like brush it off and think, Oh, I'm just overreacting. I don't want to be like the super, I've heard a lot of moms say this, like, I don't want to be the overly emotional patient or the high maintenance patient. And I'm always like, what I've found over all these years is like, trust your gut. If, if something doesn't feel right, then trust your gut. And if you have a provider saying it looks fine and you still don't feel like something feels right, keep pushing. And it's unfortunate that as women, we have to do that sometimes, a lot of times, but um, because our providers should be our advocates. But I think that, you know, just knowing just one provider telling you something doesn't, you know, seems fine doesn't mean that they're right and you're wrong. 
Yeah. And what are the common things that you see uh, that, that people struggle with as far as postpartum mental health? Yeah. I mean, I see, you know, the sort of textbook postpartum depression and anxiety and, um, and postpartum PTSD. I see um, relational adjustment, you know, marital adjustment. I see um, also just sort of a, like, who am I now of a loss of self for moms, um, especially if like you worked and now you're not, or with COVID specifically, there's, um, an even more increased feeling of like, of that, right. Of feeling really isolated and loss of like your whole life in a sense, the normalcy of life. Um, so those are the main overarching things that I deal with. And, you know, within that realm of like, um, parental adjustment, uh, what are some of the things to kind of expect? Like if, if somebody is expecting their first baby, now you're going from two to three, or there's a member added to your family. What are some of the things to expect for these new parents of what's going to change and how to sort yeah. of prepare for it? Yeah. Um, you mean as a couple or just for them both individually and as a couple? I guess yeah. both. Yeah. So, I mean, I think on an individual level, there's that expectation of like, as a woman, let's talk about the women first. Your body is going to feel different. Um, you are going to be so tired. <laughs> you're going to feel like if you're breastfeeding, you're going to feel like your body's not yours and really hasn't felt like yours already, right? A lot of times. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect. Um, and you are going to feel really vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability in um, birth and postpartum, right? And so. Um, really tender about things, I think. And there's also, I think, a new level of, well, you experience like the mom guilt stuff for the first time too, sort of this like, do you get to have a sense of self still or do you just have to be there for this child 100% of the day? Um, and then I think for the spouses, a lot of what we don't talk about for husbands um, is that they are, they're experiencing a change too. They're experiencing um, a change in, oh my gosh, my partner isn't the same um, many times, right? They've lost sort of that version of their partner. They've lost their partner to the baby maybe. Um, and then they know through a lot of research that men really, um, their testosterone actually drops after a baby's born. And they are really focused on like biologically almost like on work and like money and that's kind of where they swing whereas women you know we just swing to very mostly like maternal kind of like protector kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's kind of their like mode that they swing into um and one of the things I found really interesting um in some research I'm reading about is about how obviously the biological and neurological changes that happen to us so like for instance women you have the amygdala which, you know, is where we process like fear, fight, flight, freeze kind of thing. And, and also threats. And so women, I think their amygdala increases, like it starts functioning 30% more than it did before. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of where we're like, that helps, I think women make sense of like, oh, that's why I'm always kind of a little worried about my baby. And whereas husbands, theirs does increase, but not near as much. So I think a lot of times women are like, why isn't my husband so worried about this or that? Or why, why am I the only one obsessing? And it's like, well, if you're the primary caregiver, um, then you're actually, and it can happen for men too, if they're the primary caregiver. But since I feel like m many times in our society, women are, although that's changing, um, women tend to feel like it's imbalanced and that's because of the change in the brain. And I think that's good for women to realize when they feel frustrated with their husbands, that it's actually a neurological change that, um, and I think when they understand that, then there's a little less feeling of like, I'm alone or feeling like they don't care. Um, but when that translates, when you're seeing all these changes happen, and then that's translating into like, he doesn't care, or she only cares about the baby, then there's this like tension that can happen in the relationship. And I think what is so common is every, people just, you're sleep deprived, your life is different, all these different changes are happening and there's less space for each other anymore. And so sometimes because that's happening, people just kind of, they don't, they're not super intentional about coming back together. And then the distance just kind of keeps happening to where it's really hard to come back together. And then it's a lot more strained. And then the byproduct of that is that postpartum depression and anxiety can be worse. If you don't feel like 
your partner is with you in it, if you don't feel supported, then that can also be a byproduct. Yeah, postpartum in general can be isolating. And when totally. you're not finding support within uh, your little family, mm-hmm. it can mm-hmm. be even harder. But I really found it fascinating about the amygdala and, yeah. and the disparity between like what biology does to the birthing mm-hmm. parent and the non-birthing parent. And yep. I think that would be good for people to know because we often just like, well, you don't care and you don't care as much, you know, yep. the, the disparity in the level of concern. But mm-hmm. what's interesting is it's almost like evolutionary where if you go back to like the the cave days of whoever gave birth needed to make sure that the offspring survived so that's why they were on this heightened level of vigilance of is the baby breathing you know am i awake like you know birthing parents will often tell you they wake up before the baby actually wakes up and you know that's the biology so some of that might just be (laughs) you know that and i don't think we make sound judgment on two hours of sleep no so (laughs) I remember, in, I remember in our PEPS group, um, mm-hmm. one of the thing our PEPS leader had said at that time, whatever you say to each other after two in the morning, it's it doesn't count. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. count. It does. exactly. And it's so right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I know we keep talking about postpartum depression and postpartum mm-hmm. anxiety and mm-hmm. postpartum depression is so often spoken about. So can mm-hmm. you speak a little bit as to like, What's the difference between postpartum yeah. depression and anxiety and which one's more common and, you know, can they coexist? Yes. Um, well, so, okay. The difference between postpartum depression and anxiety is the anxiety aspect is really just about like when you're finding yourself worrying about the baby's safety or just the baby a lot, like worrying about um, that aspect of, of sort of life and, and other things too, but a lot of how the anxiety plays out is connected to the baby. Um, And it's that hypervigilance again, like is something going to happen? And um, that can really impact sleep. I I have a lot of clients that really get, um, when they have anxiety, they get into these cycles where they worry about the sleep that they're not going to get. And so they'll get um, closer to bedtime and they'll start to, that thing will start happening in their brain where they're like, oh my gosh, I know I'm going to get woken up at this time and then I'm not going to get this much sleep. And it becomes this thing that actually keeps them from sleeping. So if you're noticing these cyclical patterns in your brain where you just get stuck and then you, what you will do is you'll just begin to catastrophize. You'll think of the absolute worst thing that could happen. And so it's a lot of like, it's, it's run out of fear, you know, like something bad happening. I think that's the real, that and um, irritability again, being a thing are, are real, um, markers, but I think the worrying aspect is the biggest difference. Um, but, but a lot of everything else is kind of shared. So yes, you can have depression and anxiety together. It's often very common to have levels of depression and anxiety together. And also I think what they're realizing, I think I've read this recently is that anxiety is more prevalent than depression. Um, or at least it's as equal. We didn't talk as much about p- postpartum anxiety for a long time. And the more I think that they're researching it, they're realizing actually it might be more present than they realized before. Yeah. And that kind of, that, that stands true for what I see for my patient mm-hmm. population. I see postpartum yeah. anxiety a lot more yeah. um, than postpartum depression. And yes. most of the screening tools that we have at different mm-hmm. landmarks are for postpartum depression. So yep. it's just very easy to fly under the radar with all these struggles totally. because they don't get, they don't get picked because we're not asking mm-hmm. the right questions yes. um, in some ways. So I wanted to talk about like this, you know, very gray area of it's not necessarily traumatic because from the external view of whoever sets these standards, everything seems to have gone well as far as the birth and the baby and the mommy. And yet something has not gone right Mm -hmm. from the Mm -hmm. mother's perspective, not about Mm -hmm. the birth, but sometimes there is just a lack of, you know, there's basically a difference between what they wanted and what they got, whether right. that is the sex of the baby, whether that is the place where they birthed, whether, so if that sort of brings a, a little bit of shame uh, to mm-hmm. even complain about it, because the, you know, the, the narrative from the society that we get is you ought to yeah. be grateful for what you have and stop complaining totally. about like, you know, things that are so can we speak a little bit about that because i see that often in my patients where Mm -hmm. there isn't a problem there just is a dissatisfaction of something that is primal and cannot be changed and uh, what can we do about that and what are sort of some of the things we can say to those moms 
Yeah. I think actually before I address that, there was one important aspect of postpartum anxiety that I didn't talk about that I want to just mention really quick is, um, and then I'll get back to that one, but is postpartum OCD, uh, which is another level of anxiety. And if, and I think that's really important because it's inclusive of intrusive, intrusive thoughts. So, um, it's important that women understand that intrusive thoughts, which are often around think feeling or having these like very vivid visions that they might hurt their baby or something bad is going to happen to them. It's, it's, um, I think a lot of women get scared because they might have this weird thought that like they're going to hit their baby's head on a table or something. It's, and they be, they begin to wonder, do I want that to happen? Is that something I, and this is very shameful too. This is an aspect of postpartum anxiety that brings up a lot of shame because they're like, why am I having these thoughts? Um, am I crazy? And it's really important for women to have the distinction that they're not crazy if they're having intrusive thoughts. Um, that's not postpartum psychosis. That is just, again, a, a different um, manifestation of your anxiety. And um, it is, the difference is that you are aware that it's alarming. You're aware that these thoughts are strange and that you don't want them. And that's how we know you're, it's not a psychosis thing because you have awareness of them being not feeling good. You don't like them. And you, um, but I think women don't talk about them because they're afraid that people yes. will think that they're crazy or that they want to hurt their baby. Or I've had women I've talked to on the warm line that are like afraid to say it because they think we're going to like call CPS on them or something. And it's so important because women need support during that time. So if they're thinking that someone's going to come take their baby away or their husband's going to think they're not safe to be around their baby, then they're not going to tell anyone. And then it's going to maybe get worse. Get worse. So that's just a really important distinction. And also an understanding that like we all have intrusive thoughts. Um, that's not abnormal for just in general, like you could just be driving down the road. Maybe some, some people hearing this will think, remember a time where they're driving down the road and you think, what if I drove off this bridge? You don't want to drive off the bridge, but your mind just kind of goes there. So it's not your fault. It's not something that you want to be happening. It's just your brain doing what your brain does. So anyway, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, no, thank Perfect. you for sharing that because a lot yeah. of women don't uh, necessarily have access to a judgment-free zone where they can say these totally. things without being afraid of, you know, all yes. of the things that you said that they will be judged for. And that's, that's, that's step one of missing out on a struggle because you, you don't say anything because you feel like you can't, yeah. right? So yeah. thank and you I for think taking us back there. You're welcome. And I think that just having family and spouses aware of that before, again, that's another thing to kind of understand pre baby or whatever, because then they're, they'll know like, Oh, my husband already knows about this. So I can talk about it. Or, you know what I mean? Again, mm -hmm. that's just like that pre education, but, um, so the shame aspect. So, um, I think the biggest thing about shame is that it holds a lot of power when we don't bring it out into the light. So when you're talking about shame around, um, like my birth was fine, but I don't, like, I still feel upset about it, or I don't, I don't like being a mom or, um, you know, a lot of women that have had infertility, they don't enjoy having newborn or, you know, they, they are not, it's not all, you know, all roses and ponies when they have a baby and they feel so much shame and guilt because they couldn't have one. And they know so many people that still can't have one yet they have one. So it's very common. And then you saying also about gender. Um, I think the same goes for any of those struggles around shame, around any of that, is that bringing it into the light, having a safe space to just have, be like, I feel this way. And then for someone like in a safe space to be able to say like, that's okay that you feel, that doesn't make you a bad person because you have these feelings. You are human and um, humans have all kinds of different feelings. And the biggest thing is just acknowledging that you have them and then working around the narrative that you have, um, working around the narrative of like, you are not bad because you have these feelings and learning to just accept that they've come up and look out. Maybe why are they coming up? Maybe they're coming up because they're trying to tell you something else. Um, but I think it's, I think what a lot, of, what happens to a lot of people is just that they hold it inside and that's how it becomes so powerful because they think they'll be judged. Um, and once you get it out into the light and you receive acceptance 
around it, that I think is probably the most powerful like way to heal from that. Yeah. And how does this change around like people who already have uh, struggles with anxiety or depression? You know, how can we set up women for success when we know that there are certain risk factors Predictors, already? Yeah. Yeah. You mean, yeah, the having postpartum depression or anxiety or any mood disorder and, and shame around it. Um, I think the biggest thing is just edge psycho ed before a baby. Um, if it's possible, just that, you know, this could happen and it's okay. You're not alone. I think that's another thing that's really important is women feeling isolated in their feelings. Like they must be the only person that has them. Um, and knowing that that's absolutely untrue that, you know, one in seven women, uh, or actually I think it's now they're saying one in five women have a postpartum mood disorder. One in three view their birth as being traumatic. So a big number. Yeah. And again, one in three is not, you have postpartum PTSD, but just that you viewed something as traumatic within your birth story. Um, and so you're experiencing some of those symptoms, but yes, it's huge. One in three. I mean, yeah, it's a huge number. Again, a lot of people don't know that. And in terms of like, um, in terms of when we talk about shame or when we talk about postpartum struggles, um, mm -hmm. how frequently do you see body image be a cause of one of the postpartum struggles? Because I see that a lot, especially if mm -hmm. somebody has had diagnosis that leads to prolapse or something, basically yeah. anatomy changing down there where um, people just really develop significant fear and just disconnect mm -hmm. with their body. How, how common is that? And, you know, can we speak about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's more common than we realize. Um, I personally, I mean, I experienced similar thing on my own personally with that. Um, I don't, I haven't had as many clients bring that into the room. Um, but that obviously it doesn't mean, I, I mean, I have a couple of clients right now, I guess that are, you know, so I, I, it's not that I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's not as common, obviously as you, because what you're dealing with is Correct. in the area. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it's very, I think what stands out to me with any of those clients is the themes of, um, I can't rely on my body anymore. That is something that comes up. Um, and also one of the things that comes up, I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but I'm thinking through it, um, is just that when you have a birth injury like that, um, you can't get away from it. So whereas like, say you had, you got in a car accident and you like, that was obviously traumatic and you broke some bones, but they healed, right? Like that you you don't wake up every morning and feel necessarily the broken bone every day. So when women obviously have trauma um, from birth, whether from tearing or um, prolapses, things like that, um, they're literally waking up with the sensations of, and then the reminder of where that came from. They're like, I, I remember feeling this way personally, like I felt like a walking wounded, like, like a, like, yeah, just like an open wound walking around and an open, like, and just, I felt like my body itself was a trigger. Um, because every day I would have things come up that reminded me of what I went through. And I think what's important to know about that is it can be really hard to, um, well, A, there's shame because we culturally in a society, we don't talk about the vagina. We don't talk about female body parts enough with young girls and sort of the love and acceptance of our body. Um, I think it's very much yeah, I mean, just not something we celebrate or we bring into conversation and families and just in schools and things like that. So I think that's part of the issue around shame is that maybe we all have a little bit of shame already in our within ourselves of like, I don't know if you see that, but I feel like I see a lot Definitely. of that. So um, again, I think just in, it, in order to heal the shame and work through the shame is is creating that like changing that narrative that like again because you have this thing that happened to you um that you did not cause um because i think a lot of us take that on too we we take on somehow i could have prevented this um and so them accepting that like i did not cause this there was nothing i could have done to prevent it and um and just finding ways to see what well, where where in your story that was traumatic 
do you see your strength? Where do you see the things that are bright spots in your story? I'm kind of bringing the light parts out of the story and holding on to those. So it's not just this heavy weight of all the bad that's going on. Um, I think that's really powerful. And um, I think also just, again, holding space that like, just because something feels broken in you doesn't mean you are broken. And, and that's a powerful sentence because a lot of times I hear that from patients that I feel broken yes. or my vagina feels broken yes. or, you know, broken is a word that is, that gets you. And it's a very powerful word. It tells yeah. you where, where that person is. And so thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is more logistical in terms of somebody signing up for therapy postpartum mm -hmm. because mm -hmm postpartum life is so busy, people yeah. don't have time to feed themselves. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times women see the need, they're ready to start that, they, they, they find that it will be helpful for them, but they're just holding off because they don't know what they're signing up for. So I wanted to kind of throw a little light on what, what to expect. Is this something that they're going to need for eight weeks? And I know it depends. So there is, you know, there's not going to, we're yeah. not going to be able to answer the question for everyone, but sort of like what's our shortest mm -hmm. and longest commitment we're looking mm -hmm. for. So yeah. that doesn't become a barrier for people to start care. Totally. I think one thing I would add to that is, you know, because we know in the postpartum period, um, we're overwhelmed and it's hard, especially if you're feeling postpartum depression, what's super common is to feel even overwhelmed to make phone calls that wouldn't mm -hmm. have helped. So like you're much less likely to do that with depression to reach out for help anyway, because it just feels like heavy. One more thing to do. Mm -hmm. So what I, any pregnant women that I know that or work with who already maybe have had infertility, have, um, have already experienced depression or anxiety in their life or specifically during the perinatal time, if you have any of those predictors of potential, because those are all predictors of potential postpartum depression and anxiety, then I would like to say to them, start with a therapist now while you're pregnant um, so that you have that relationship already set up mm -hmm. so that then you can just already be connected. So, you know, that's ideal, right? But if we don't have that ideal, right, then, um, you know, there's great resources like the warm line where you could call in in your postpartum period and they will help connect you to therapists. They will find therapists in your area. They will find therapists who take your insurance. They will make sure that the therapists that they're referring to you have op you to have openings. Um, so they do, they'll do a lot oh, of that yeah. work. That's huge. For you. Yes. Yes. And again, I think we all get the perinatal support flyer in our, those like packets that the hospital sent home and stuff. But again, there's a lot of stuff in there and it's <laughs> easily, we, we can easily pass by that. So um, it's a great resource, but finding a perinatal therapist, you know, if you can, if you have access to one in the area that you live in is good and important. Um, and then if you get connected with one, I think it's, it's good to know that really our main goal first and foremost, is how do we reduce these symptoms as soon as possible so that you can feel like you're at your baseline again? Um, now, because I, I like to tell clients, like, you have a new baseline. Like, you're not, after having a baby, going to feel like the self you were before because you had a baby. <laughs> like, you are a changed human. But what is a livable baseline, you know? And we might talk about what that would look like for you in the first few sessions and kind of make it a goal. And then it's not really about like, let's talk about your past or let's talk about like family stuff or that's a different kind of therapy. And although that could easily come into the room naturally, you know, my first priority is always going to be reducing your symptoms. Um, like if you're not sleeping, we're going to figure out how to get you sleeping. If you're not eating, we're going to figure out how to, you know, just getting your mood better so that you want to do those things. And that could, like you said, that could be a shorter amount of time if we're just looking at symptoms um, because we might get like a really good um, program going for you and ways and resources set up and coping mechanisms that work really well to where, you know, it's like, I don't know, like eight sessions and you feel like, hey, I'm doing okay. Um, but I think what's really common is when we begin, almost everyone that I've worked with, when we start beginning the work, um, other things just naturally and organically come up um, around, you know, identity and around relational stuff. And those are generally intertwined in the work. Um, so, but 
I never look at it as like, I need, you need to come to therapy for years. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm all about how can we get you feeling better the quickest, yeah. like in the shortest amount of time possible. Yeah. Thank you. And I think you answered my next question uh, uh -huh. in this about like resources that people can kind of have handy mm -hmm. uh, if they mm -hmm. are in need. So we talked about the warm line and I will include that in show notes for yeah. the audience, but are there any other resources that are sort of DIY in terms of people seeking help? Yeah. I mean, the PSI is a good one, obviously that, and they, like PSI is the international one. And then our local ones, Perinatal Support of Washington. Um, there are lots of, I don't know if people want to read books to prepare, you know, there's books by a woman named Karen Kleiman, who writes a lot about postpartum depression and anxiety and, um, just all, all encompassing things about motherhood. I would always refer any of her books. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that are great resources. Um, you know, finding support groups, you know, right now everything's online. So that's <laughs> not ideal, but there are Zoom support groups. And I think that um, especially now with COVID and the feelings of isolation that literally every mom I'm talking to is having, um, even though it's online, it's something. And so um, I definitely encourage that. Um, and I don't, maybe you're, this question is going to come later, but I think also just um, having like the people in your life that you know you can kind of reach out to and having if you have that kind of community you know just having them as support is really important too yeah so sort of creating your village beforehand if you will yeah. yeah yeah thank you i think i think that was all of my questions and i i is there anything that you feel like i should have touched base on or something that you see oftenly come up and we didn't talk about um i'm not I don't know. I was looking through our kind of questions that we talked about, mm -hmm. but I'm not, well, I think maybe one thing that would be good to talk about is just intimacy and marital relationship. And we, we touched a little bit about on uh, the idea of how we each change and, mm -hmm. you know, and how there might be distance, but I do want to just stress that it is very common. I mean, if you read any literature about marital satisfaction after baby. I think most of us know it dips. <laughs> um, but I think the way to combat that a little bit, um, if you do any reading from Gottman, who is our like wonderful, you know, Seattle based um, marriage expert, um, he will tell you that the health of the relationship before you have kids or the foundation of the relationship determines how you're going to be after the baby. A lot of times. So if you're in a really good place, relational, if you have really healthy communication, if you know that each other is a priority, even before you're married, then you're more like, you're more less likely to have that dip. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't know that we often realize that um, until after we have children, maybe like, oh, maybe we weren't as in sync or, you know, those things come up often. Um, having a baby shines a light on kind of those little um, cracks. Um, and so what I would say to anyone is that a intimacy is going to drop for a while. You had a baby, you're not going to want to have sex. I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people don't want to have sex for a while <laughs> because you might be waking up a lot, feeding your baby a lot. Um, your body feels weird. You've gained weight, you know, um, there's a, just a host of reasons. And I think I want women to know it's okay if you don't want to have sex right now. There are seasons where you do and seasons where you don't. And right now, not saying that you should just never talk about that or never have intimacy, but there are other ways to have intimacy that are not like traditional sex. So um, keeping that in mind that you don't have to do that to still have intimacy and it's okay. You're not a bad wife if you are not there. And, um, but the biggest, I think the most important factor is just constant communication, keeping in step with each other um, setting times aside each week that you talk to each other, making, actually prioritizing your marriage first, because when there's the healthy marriage, when you feel well supported, then you yourself are going to be a more emotionally healthy human and parent, and it will trickle down to the motherhood. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like 
you know. Yeah, that's huge. That's important that. because, you know, mm-hmm. you're right on that. The more you nourish yourself, you're yep. better able to nourish your yep. family. So that's yep. a huge point. And thank you for kind of bringing yeah, that sure. up. Yeah. So thanks again, Kristen. The, yeah. the next piece is the fun piece where we, uh, where we just go over some questions. And uh, yeah. that, that segment is called The One Thing. Mm-hmm. And we basically, it's a quick advice on what's the one thing people should remember. Um, mm-hmm. So if you're ready, that's what we're going to start ready. with next. All right. So these are all questions with mental health um, Mm -hmm. angle of like keeping in mind of how can we set up people for success for mental health uh, in pregnancy and postpartum. So what's the one thing uh, people should include in their birth plan? Um, Well, I was thinking flexibility. Yes. And that's been a popular answer by all the (laughs) providers that I have spoken to. That's funny. That makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) What's the one thing to not have in my birth plan? Um, I think it kind of ties to the first answer, but rigid expectations. Mm -hmm. And what's the one thing you would tell uh, women to work on during pregnancy so that they're mentally prepared for all the challenges that are? Um, Postpartum support. So thinking about after, I think we we focus a lot on the during um, and we don't think a lot about the after part. And so thinking through what you're going to need in the postpartum period. And what's the one thing you would tell this postpartum mother as far as communication of, you know, what she needs or doesn't need to kind of help more mental support? Communication around what she needs or doesn't need. What would I tell her? Um, To always reach out for help. Even if, you know, even if you question whether you really need it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. What's the one thing you would tell the family around this birthing parent to look for in terms of when to ask, when to give help, even if it's not being asked? Um, I would say uh, specifically if they're not, if there's disinterest in the child, that would be a huge red flag. Um, or honestly, if they're just not seeming like themselves themselves yeah yeah what's the one piece of advice you would give moms suffering from anxiety or depression pre-pregnancy pre-pregnancy um get a therapist (laughs) (laughs) and what's the one thing that you find most helpful as far as improving parent communication in a marriage after birth improving parent communication um i would say you uh a really simple one is using i statements owning your own feelings, but not um, being accusatory. So can you elaborate more on that? Can you yeah. give us an example of what that means? Yeah. So say that you are, cause I think a lot of times what happens in um, when we have kids is we kind of, we're always kind of like, well, I did all this today. And you know, there's a very, there's a lot of like, sort of like who's done more. Um, we can get into that tit for tat kind of thing. And instead of looking at it that way, I think realizing, well, why do I feel that way? Well, instead of saying, well, you didn't um, take out the trash today, or you didn't do the dishes, saying, um, I am feeling overwhelmed, and I really need your help. So your partner is much more likely to respond positively to that way of communicating, and less likely to like, you didn't do this. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my last question is, what's the one thing you would want to say to mothers who are struggling with shame postpartum, um, you know, and the cause being something that's not very obvious to the world, but something that they are holding shame about. No, they're holding shame. Um, you are loved <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and it's not your fault. I know that's more than one thing, but I just wanted to say all the all No, things. there are always exceptions because this did require more than one thing. So yeah. that was all of my questions. Thank okay. you so much, Kristen. I, yeah, I really did me. enjoy. I, I want to give you a next couple of minutes to tell our audience about you, where to find you, if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way and mm-hmm. what's the kind of people that you like working with. So if there's somebody out there looking for help, they can mm-hmm. kind of reach out to you. Sure. Um, well, the best way to find me is kristenhilltherapy.com. Um, that's where you can find out more information about who I am and scheduling appointments, things like that, uh, what I focus on. And then, um, I mean, the kind of clients I work for are, or work with are um, mainly women who are either pregnant or postpartum. And, but I also, I think it's important to emphasize that I love working with the couples around um, I I do talk to the couples too, a lot of times bringing in the spouse around relational stuff or how they could better support their spouse. 
And additionally, men have postpartum depression too. We don't talk about that. It's about one in 10 or they think probably more like one in seven and it's underreported. Um, and I think that's, that's something that I'm always happy to work with if um, a husband is struggling to help support them too. All right. That's excellent. Yeah. Thanks again for your time and for sharing yeah, all this you. valuable information with us. Sure. Um, thank you for all the audience for joining in. I hope you found this helpful and I'm going to peace out now until we meet again. All right. Have a good day, Kristen. Bye-bye. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I really hope you got something out of it. I appreciate your time. And I enjoy hearing back from you guys. So if there are any questions, comments, or concerns, you know where to find me. If there's a topic that you've been wanting to hear about, reach out to me and I'll see what I can do. Once again, thank you for being here. Stay safe and don't forget to come back. Peace out.